Well, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm George Fairbanks. Thanks very much for inviting me here to Atlanta. Um, I want to thank uh, Max and John and David and anybody else that I probably should be thanking but I'm not aware of that uh, enabled this thing to happen. Uh, it's a great opportunity for me. I've been working on uh, this topic. It comes from the book, uh, Architecture Hoisting, and I've been trying to elaborate it to make it a little bit more clear. And I hope you guys like it. Um, one thing you'll note about this talk is that uh, it's not a brand new chunk of anything, right? In instead, it's a reflection on things that we've already done and trying to organize the chaos that's there. One of the things that uh, I like to, to work on is that over time, uh, we as engineers have to take the knowledge that we've got and compact it, because if we don't compact what we already know, the next generation is going to just know a different chunk of stuff that we did, rather than what we knew plus some extra stuff. You know, this whole idea of standing on the shoulders of giants only works if you could understand what they do and then learn some more, right? So, for me, the process of taking what we already know, and I'm sure you guys have seen stuff like we're going to talk about here, is good. But hey, what if we could teach that to 22 year olds or something like that, rather than having to wait until we've been in the industry and have battle scars that we finally understand what's going on? And so, in fact, you can look at a lot of what we do. Uh, even in literature and so forth, as a way of teaching other people, you know, the experiences of the, of the battle scarred veterans. Okay, so uh, architecture hoisting is something like that. So this is a little bit about me. You guys probably have taken a look at the website or something like that. Um, one thing uh, is in red here. That's uh, for me to um, uh, highlight and remember to, to, to tell you guys about. Um, I'm uh, the program chair for the Saturn 2012 conference, which you may know is the SEI's. Uh, practitioner-oriented uh, software architecture conference. There's really only two architecture conferences in the US. Uh, there's Saturn and then there's Wixa, which it Wixa actually alternates between the US and Europe, but uh, it's more academic-oriented. So professors go to that, and then guys who build software for a living go to this one. Highly recommended. It's a great program this year. Please bend my ear about it afterwards. Um, it's, you know, if you're interested in architecture, you don't have a lot of options, but we've got some particularly good talks and uh, high-quality stuff. If your concern is just a bunch of guys uh, following along the SEI and they all have like stars on their on their shoulders and stuff like that, this is not the case. We've got uh, a good cross section of industry, uh, predominantly industry actually, not so much uh, military stuff. So, uh, real big fan of that stuff. So, here is a preview of what's going on in the talk, um, and this is not meant to make a whole lot of sense, but that's sort of the point: is that uh, you're going to see this stuff and then we're going to fill in all the blanks. What we do as when we design things is we're trying to reason through our arrangement of the software such that we're gonna get what we expect. And the idea here is almost never do you guys set out to make a video game and accidentally build a fish tank controller, right? It never happens that you're really completely off. But there are certain kinds of failures that do happen. You might try to make it and it turns out to be unreliable, right? So, what we want to do then is make software that we can reason through and then make sure that we get what we want. And of course, there's things that are easy to do for us as humans, and there are things that are hard to do. Uh, and so um, that, that's the general goal. To that end, to figure out what stuff is easy and is hard, we're going to talk about two different kinds of design ideas, intentional and extensional. This language comes from math, and you'll notice there's not a T, so it's not intentional, it's intentional. And the intentional stuff uh, map straight to code. So for example, if you have a car and you want a left turn signal, you can look at the car and say, does it have a left turn signal, okay? If you have a car and you want it to be reliable, there's no particular place in the code you look to figure out where the reliability part is, right? It's, an, it's a holistic property. So any of the stuff we refer to as quality attributes generally gets into that hard category, okay? In the small, you guys are familiar with the in the large and the small distinction, there was a Dreamer and Cron paper in the 70s that talked about, hey, we're very good at building modules in the small, but there's this bigger thing about in the large where we're connecting a bunch of modules together. That's really the great, great grandfather of what we consider uh, software architecture today. So in the small, if we want to maintain an invariant, we can do that. We can just be diligent, we can be vigilant, we can make sure that we're gonna you know, maintain that invariant. But the larger our programs get, so in the large, it becomes very difficult to ensure that you've done that thing, okay? So uh, how do I know I still have a reliable system you know, after 100 million lines of code? So uh, this talk is gonna be specifically about techniques that people have used that I'm gonna categorize as architectural hoisting, which is you hand the job of making sure that quality attribute stays true to a chunk of the architecture. We're we'll seeing a bunch of examples of that. Okay, make sense? That's where we're going. So it doesn't all have to make sense yet, but that's sort of the, the pre uh, version 
So let's start out with a, a story here of two different developers. Uh, the developer on the left is Grumpy. Um, he's grumpy about being forced to use a framework uh, on his job. He says, this application framework stinks. It has constraints on what I can do. Uh, it's bureaucratic and worse, it forces me to use Java. And it's probably, you, you've never seen anyone grumble anything like this before, right? On the right hand side, we've got another grumpy developer. This guy builds Chrome. This is based upon um, a, a contest that happened this week, which is that there was a um, remote uh, code execution exploit found in the Chrome web browser, which obviously Google's taking great pains to avoid. Uh, and they have a pretty good class of developer over there, right? Uh, and it was a, an exploit based on a use after free bug. So an example of that is uh, you use some memory, you freed it up, and then somebody still grabbed it later on and then somehow figured how to turn that into an exploit, okay? And we know it's hard to avoid such bugs. So the guy on the left is grumpy because he's being overly constrained, and the guy on the right is grumpy because somebody found a remote exploit into his code. Okay, so we're gonna sort of trace these two guys as we go through the talk. Architecture hoisting uh, is not a term that I invented. Uh, it came from a project I was working on uh, almost a decade ago, uh, and it came from uh, NASA JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, JPL, I, I think I'm accurate in saying this, doesn't get to do anything that industry knows how to do. So for example, if Lockheed Martin already knows how to launch this thing and put it in orbit, JPL doesn't get to do that. If there's no industry partner that knows how to say, put it on Mars reliably, well then JPL works on that, and then once it's known, it sort of gets shifted off. So JPL is always working on the fringe of what is possible to do with our technology and, and pushing the boundaries of how that stuff goes. In this particular mission, they had the trouble that there was a disconnect between the way the software was written how, how traditionally it had been written in C and so forth, and you just trust the software developer. Uh, compared to, they had this other discipline inside uh, JPL, which was the system engineering. And, I, and by systems, I don't mean like operating systems and databases, I mean like the whole thing, what are the risks, how do we figure out if the spacecraft is really gonna do stuff, what are the phases of the mission, like boosting, traveling, landing, you know, exploration. So they would do, uh, the system engineers would investigate that stuff, and they would say, well, this is the way we're gonna do all the stuff, here's the equations, here's how we, we're gonna have confidence that stuff is gonna work. And then the software guys would take over, and we know how we write stuff, right? We just write some code, and we say, yeah, it does what you asked me to do. But when these guys investigated it, they didn't see a clear mapping between, this is this risk, this is this control system, you know, all these sort of abstractions we're using in the system engineering domain. They didn't have those same abstractions in the code. So it became difficult for these guys to have confidence, right, from a system perspective that the software was gonna enable this mission and that there wasn't, in fact, some subtle bug. With everyone's best intentions, there weren't bugs somewhere. Okay, so they came up with this idea of hoisting, which is that they would take a bunch of these problems that we would see, this being one of them, and they would hoist it into the architecture. So if you're worried about, for example, you've heard in space missions, occasionally you get these priority inversion problems where some low-level menial task is actually consuming your resources when in fact you're trying to steer the spacecraft, which is some high-level task, and somehow these things get tangled up, and you end up uh, doing the thing that's unimportant instead of the thing that's really very, very important. So they hoisted uh, the control, the scheduling stuff, into its own part of the architecture, and you would essentially plug your stuff into the architecture and say, please schedule me, right? So rather than you being able to um, accidentally consume too many resources, it would work that way. And there were a whole bunch of other things uh, regarding topology and how the control theory works and which variables were exposed, like here's the velocity, or my best guess of the velocity of my spacecraft, okay? So this project, unfortunately, uh, did not get to go to completion, okay? So um, this is unfortunate. Uh, as you guys might remember, um, uh, around 10 years ago, or a little less now, uh, a lot of the NASA stuff was uh, reduced in funding, and so this is one of the things that didn't get to continue, okay? So, uh, I believe now that they're still sort of using the old stuff rather than this MDS mission data system uh, kind of software. However, the idea of architecture hoisting lives on, and so that's what we're going to talk about here today. But instead of talking about this, which is somewhat esoteric and not connected to our lives, let's talk about something mundane and pretty much everybody here has seen before. Uh, servlets and EJB, okay? Uh, has anyone here actually done servlet programming? Yes, okay, good. So you can keep me honest on these things because uh, it's been a while since I've done this stuff and it does evolve over time, so let me know if I, I go astray. I'm gonna compare uh, two Java technologies for running little chunks of code over on a server, okay? But those two things are EJB and Enterprise Java Beans and, and servers. And uh, I'm gonna say that they have a lot of things in common. 
that uh, with the server, concurrency is inherent. Sometimes in programs, we throw some concurrency in there to get better utilization or better response time or something like that. That's not the case with servers, right? They literally are forced to respond because the two of you made a request to me at the same time that, you know, like I, I can't control you and say, hold on just a second, right? You know, I mean, I can choose once I've received the request to say not service it yet, but the point is I do have to, you know, acknowledge that I got two different requests. So, uh, the server itself consists of two different parts. It has the shared code, which is in this case the EJB container or the servlet container, plus all the handler routines that you plug in to say, well, we need a request for this, then run this code and then give this response back, okay? And the requirement is, regardless of what I do, is that I have to be safe about the concurrency, that if you know, two requests come in to me at the same time, they don't accidentally interfere with each other and cause trouble. So, uh, there are two different approaches to this taken by servlets and EJB. The servlet approach, which is the older of the two, was it asked developers to write re-entrant, uh, safe re-entrant handlers, okay? It says essentially, be prepared. I may call your code twice. So there's a certain number of things you probably can't do. And it doesn't enumerate them, but it's, it you know, expects you to write thread safe code. Things would include, uh, if you have a local variable, that's gonna go on the stack. If there's two different calls into you, that's two different places in the stack, that's safe. However, if you take some variable and you stick it in a class, in you know, like a field of your class, well, that same class could be having two threads run through it, and so we would both be accessing the same variable. And I, I'm sure that's only the tip of the iceberg as far as the tricky ways the job can cause you trouble as far as uh, making sure that you have re code. Um, I have a feeling that most developers can just sort of write code and you probably will be safe. Okay, but you don't have great confidence you're going to be safe. So really what you should be doing is really thinking about concurrency the whole time. I don't think that really takes place. Uh, those of you who raised your hand about uh, servlet development, did you guys have, like, was this a big prominent thing on your mind is, you know, here are exactly the conventions you need to follow for servlet programming to make sure, it, you know, you had safe concurrency? You have to think about it every time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We got to the point where we always tested, you know, people trying to hit it as fast as possible just because we're blind things no matter what. Right, right, and that's trouble too, right? Because uh, testing can show the presence but not the absence of bugs, right? Uh, so yeah, you ran as many things, you said, well, I didn't see any concurrency problems, but you know, maybe we run it another half hour and maybe we'll find one, right? Okay, well that's good. I'm glad to hear that people were aware of this. Um, Enterprise Java Beans has a, has a different pattern, uh, which is that the app server guarantees that it's not gonna use the same chunk of code twice. It's not re entered okay? So I'm gonna be a little bit uh, picky and I'm gonna write this uh, carefully here. It says, uh, for all requests, for any two requests, X and Y, uh, if they overlap in time, that is, you know, between when the res request comes in and the response goes out, if they overlap, the handler for X is not the handler for Y, okay? Now, I believe that this is something like what the EJB spec says that the server must do. In practice, what a server will do is, if two requests come in and they're overlapping, it'll spin up another you know, it'll create another bean so that I can run two threads at the same time. And it manages a pool of them, so if another two requests come in, it already has the two. And if it's sitting there dormant for a while, it'll throw one away and say, okay, I just got a small pool. So it'll ramp up the pool of these things and, and drop them back down, okay? And so as a consequence, developers, I would say, are oblivious to the concurrency, right? They need not think about concurrency in this case because there's no re -entrance. Now, of course, there's a trade-off in performance, right? Because the, the server is trying to spin up more copies of code and, and it's creating data structures, essentially, that represent that stuff. Uh, there's a cost to that. And I don't know how much faster, but presumably somebody's thought about this and says, you know, at the max, if you had safe re-entrant code, the servlets would be faster, right? Because you're not doing this creation instruction of data structures for each request. You just reuse the ones that exist, okay? Does this make sense? There's two different approaches. And in one of them, it's asking uh, developers to be vigilant, right? Be aware, write safe, concurrent code. And over here, uh, you essentially said there's a mechanism provided to you by the container such that you don't have to worry about that anymore. You're gonna guarantee you're gonna get safe concurrency out of it. Does this example make sense? Okay, because this is the crux of what we're talking about here. So, in the book, I characterize, it, I characterize this as architectural hoisting, uh, and that would be that you give the architecture a specific responsibility to handle a quality attribute, in this case, concurrency, uh, some sort of requirement for a property, right? So there may be properties other than quality attributes you want to uh, maintain. Um, 
And so in this example, the enterprise job being server hoists the concurrency problem into the architecture. It says, you don't have to worry about this, you don't have to be vigilant, you can just, you just get it, okay? And then it talks about two other different kinds of approaches to software architecture. Uh, not quite as strong as architectural ho hoisting is architecture focused design. And if you ever read a software architecture book, pretty much this is what they're assuming. They're assuming that you're thinking about architecture, you're designing the architecture, you're looking at your quality attributes, and you're making sure that the two are compatible with each other, right? I chose a kind of system that probably will help me get these quality attributes. And I'm gonna compare that with what I think the, the current state of the, the practice is today. Most people, when they go to build something, most developers are not aware of, say, the Len Pass, Paul Clements book on software architecture. They're not really doing this. They're just sort of uh, following in the footsteps of what people have done before. If somebody else built a three-tier system, they're building a three-tier system. And there's a bunch of folklore running around about why you should build things in certain ways, but it's not a principled understanding of how you match up. These are the needs I've got, including functional and quality attribute responsibilities. And here's the architecture that I've chosen, and I can show you why that it's suitable, right? I don't think that's going on, okay? That's architecture focused, the, the choosing the suitable one. I think a lot of times we're not seeing that today. So one thing you'll notice here is that you probably, if you wanna have hoisting, you most often will have a chunk of your architecture which exists at runtime. So consider a pipe and filter system. This is like what architects always choose, right? The pipe and filter architecture style. You need not have any of that exist at runtime, that is, you as a developer create a pipe. You as a developer create a filter, right? The architecture, there's no shared code anywhere, right? I just sort of conform to the style. Compare that with what we're talking about with EJB. There's an actual application server that's handed to you and says you add things to the application server, right? So there's a chunk of stuff that exists. Plenty of other examples. And enterprise message buses. If you want to have reliable, durable message delivery, well, guess what? You've got a chunk of code that buffers your requests and writes them to disks so that they're, they're durable and then make sure that you've got uh, quality of service kind of uh, delivery guarantees for these things, okay? And, and these sort of patterns are going on. Again, what I'm telling you in this talk is not anything you haven't seen before, I'm just helping you recognize it in a different way that I, by the end of the talk, hope you'll look at this and go, yes, I can see how that's helpful. Okay, so at this point, here we are at the beginning of the talk, I sort of caught you up with everything that was in the book. And since I wrote the book, I've gotten some critiques from other people that says, you know, this is a really interesting thing, but you're really sort of fuzzy about it. I mean, when can I use hoisting? How do I use hoisting? Which things are suitable for hoisting? So we really shouldn't be satisfied with where we are right now. Let me be specific about that. We should be unsatisfied because, first, the nature of exactly what is hoisting is sort of not well understood. That, that wasn't as good as it could be. Second is the definition is not clear. What does it mean to assign responsibility to, for a quality attribute to, for, to, the, um, to the architecture? And then finally, in which cases uh, is architecture hoisting a good idea or a bad idea? Is it, is it useful for some things and not useful for other things? None of this stuff is handled in the book. I mean, I think we could make some guesses about it, but the point of this talk is to try and flesh all that stuff out. And what we'd like to do here is come up with some better definitions of what, what it is, when it's applicable, what alternatives you have besides hoisting, and give you a background, a conceptual model you need in order to reason about this stuff, okay? And we'll talk more about conceptual models too. So in order to get there, we're gonna have to talk about two things in particular. Uh, I have a feeling you've probably never heard the terms intentional and extensional before. I think these are obscure. And then finally, I'm gonna talk, or secondly, I'm gonna talk about uh, constraints versus guidelines, okay? Intentional and extensional design intent. Well, it sounds really esoteric and fuzzy, but let's make this nice and concrete. Intentional stuff is elements that are universally quantified. For example, all filters can communicate via pipes, right? Uh, in no circumstances should the front end communicate directly with the back end unless it goes through the middle tier, right? Uh, no uh, request should circumvent the cache, right? These are all examples of overall that apply to every element generally, and we, we do these kinds of things all the time, okay? That would be intentional uh, design intention. Extensional is where you enumerate or name the elements, okay? My system consists of an X, a Y, and a Z, okay? If you're building a video player, you might say my, my system consists of a video buffer, a codec, and a rendering engine. Oh, and a handler for the user interface, right? So you name those things and you sort of place them there. Architecture and design, and I'm just gonna mix these two together for the time being, right, because I'm not gonna tell you, I'm not gonna get the argument of which one's what, okay? They are a mixture of both of these things, okay? And we're gonna talk about more of that in the second slide. 
But the difference here that you'll see is the code has only extensional elements. Okay? Have you ever had a situation in the code where you could express, um, for example, don't circumvent the cache? I mean, I can express that in code, but it's always with a slash slash in front of it, or a uh, slash star, or a pound sign to indicate that this is a comment, because I can write anything I want in a comment. But otherwise, code, it's imperative. So do this, then do this, then do this. It's not easy to say, in any case, whatever you do, don't do the following. Or every time you do something, then do this thing. Right? It's hard to do that in code. So uh, on the other hand, the code is filled with all kinds of invariants and responsibility allocations and protocols that we have to respect. Okay? So we're dealing with this already in the design. And what we find is that the design follows the invariants. It respects the invariants. But you can't express them directly. Can anyone think of a counterexample to where you can directly express uh, invariants or um, uh, design guidance or protocols or anything like that? Well, there is such a thing as aspect oriented programming where you can kind of pad your code with certain you know, directives or um, suggestions and then expect the architecture to actually handle and inject you know, handlers and so on, interceptors. You're exactly right. In fact, what you can do is you can have that watch your program run at runtime. And you can say, for example, any time that this thing gets called, then do the following thing. And so that's great for logging, right? That's the, yeah. so the killer use case for as a program. But you're absolutely right that you, you can do that, but it requires something to watch your program at runtime. Okay. Uh, another example? Sometimes you have an intentional thing like a security mechanism, but you rely a little bit an extensional expression like you got to have this permission yep. to run this code. Mm -hmm. It can almost be like almost data like. Yeah. Um, so, I, what, yes. So, essentially, the, the intentional stuff is essentially like a data structure that you populated, like a, a database full of uh, security rules, right, or permissions, and then essentially you've got a runtime engine that interprets them. It looks, yeah. Yeah, it looks them up or something. Data. Or it might be in the code actually. Yeah. yeah. You could have some attributes in .NET code, or you could do the yeah. aspect oriented stuff and do yeah. the same thing. Yep. So I, I completely agree with you. There are counterexamples around the margins of these things, but I hope everyone's on the same page that for the most part, our regular code is imperative, right? Boop, 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 do these following things. And there are, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of JML, the Java modeling language, or uh, if you have a program in Eiffel, you can explicitly say this is the loop invariant. You can say this is a constraint across the class that if I have a birthday, uh, sorry, a, how old is this person and what is my birthday? You can actually relate the two as a class invariant and say there's no possible legal instance of this class where the two don't correspond. You see what I mean? But these things are relatively limited, okay? And they usually require us to run things at runtime to check those this invariants. You might be able to write a DSL that's sort of declarative programming to the point where some of this gets kind of fuzzy. That's very good. You're prefetching. You're, 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 you're getting ahead of the Next slide, okay. <laughs> not, not quite the next slide, but yeah, you're getting ahead of it. Okay, so let's take a look at the kinds of things that we find in design and the things we find in code and try to make a correspondence, okay? So let's take a look at the first row here. Uh, this lists the extensional stuff and says, in architecture you're finding things like modules, components, connectors, ports, component assemblies, and when you go down into code, you find out that those all line up very neatly with the code. I mean, they're at a bigger scale. Okay, my server is a component, okay? And it's composed of like these 30 classes. But it's just sort of like a zoomed in, zoomed out version of the same thing. Perfectly straightforward to, to map the two. There's intentional stuff. And in my design, that would include things like styles, and variance, responsibility allocations, design decisions, rationales, protocols, quality attributes, models, you know, all these kinds of things. And when I go down to the code, the code conforms to these, it respects them, it behaves as if they're, you know, these are true, but I can't directly express them in the code. Yeah. Maybe I'm missing a point. Asserts act like an invariant? Asserts also are another special case. You can do some kinds of asserts, right? Um, the, the assert statements are usually, you know, some predicate that you can express, like, you know, x plus y plus z is greater than 5, right? Or, you know, x is not null or something like that. Uh, but they need to be relatively local uh, and, and, of course, interpreted on a case by case basis when you actually run the program. So, just like when we had the concurrency problem, testing can show the existence of bugs, but not their absence. So if you'd like to be able to say, for example, uh, there's no path through the code where somebody uh, forgets to check the cache and goes directly to the database. 
Uh, this is apparently a problem they have at Facebook, or they did have at Facebook, because they use memcached e extensively. So go, go grab it out of the memory, the big distributed memory cache, and if you don't find it there, well then go grab uh, the data out of the database. Great, okay. If you do that in reverse though, where you're writing, you're supposed to remember always write it in the cache and write it in the database, right? Because otherwise you end up with trouble. Okay, and if anyone ever forgets to follow the pattern, well now you're getting crummy status updates that aren't right, okay? Uh, sorry, R-I-G-H-T, not W-R-I-T. Um, so yeah, so you've got these patterns you're supposed to follow and assert statements could catch if you ever follow one of those paths, okay? But if you didn't follow that path and didn't have the right race condition, you're not gonna be able to check it. My point being is that, yeah, you could literally make declare statements and say, declare, if I had the right language, declare this component is the following 20 classes and it's straightforward, okay? Down here, I could say, declare I'm gonna follow this protocol. You're like, yeah, that's much harder to, to do. To do. Okay. So, so one thing I need to think about is this kind of like insecurity example. So for instance, intentional thing, like, you know, all the um, users must be authenticated, right? It's pretty intentional. And it actually can be enforced uh, by various means, you know, by architecture. One of the ways, okay, this your database, um, you know, requires, in an example of SQL Server, it can require integrated Windows authentication, which pretty much ensures, unless you're trying to access it with some kind of valid, um, you know, identity principles that is somewhere in the Active Directory, you will not, you will be denied. You cannot use the application. Right. So it's, it doesn't uh, dictate which way you authenticate the user. It just ensures that at the moment you access the data, it, you will be authenticated. Right. Uh, so please, everyone, do not take what I'm trying to say here is that uh, all, if you're down here, all hope is lost, right? Everyone, everything we're talking about is we know we successfully deal with this all the time. You're talking about a mechanism, a cert statements, or another mechanism, right? There's plenty of mechanisms we have. But just to recognize that the way we deal with these things, these are straightforward, right? Shooting fish in a barrel or whatever it is. Down here, much trickier. We like have to write code that respects it and it takes a lot of vigilance on our part. Okay, so that's where I'm going with this, but I, I agree with you. So uh, I'm gonna dig in some more on the idea that in, in, invariants in the small scale, like in a data structure, and guide rails in the big structure are intentional, and that causes trouble. So let's talk about an invariant on a data structure. Take a linked list. We're gonna rewind the clock and pretend we're like uh, sophomores in college and we're taking a data structures class. And I, I remember at the time it was like the hardest 20 lines of code I've ever written or something like this, right? Making sure this data structure exactly works. Uh, does anyone feel confident enough that they want to try to articulate uh, what a structure for a linked list looks like and what an invariant across that data structure might be? Okay, let's try something even easier. Uh, if I have a linked list, certainly there are things that are not linked lists, okay? Imagine something, if I get some, if you had a student in your class and they wrote up a bad implementation of linked list, it would allow these crazy deviant cases that we're trying to disallow. What are some of those things that we were trying to disallow? Cycles. Yes, so if that has a cycle, we would say that's not a linked list. That's a very interesting data structure, but that's not a linked list, okay? So the invariant should disallow cycles, for example. Right? In fact, we can just say that is the invariant, no cycles, right? Existence of the head. Yes, existence of the head, yeah. Um, something along the lines of uh, if there's, a, if, if there's a, a sequence of things, uh, the previous guy always points to the next guy, right? Except for the very first one, which doesn't have a predecessor, and the very last one, which doesn't point at anybody, okay? But if B follows A, then there's a pointer from A to B, right? Something, something along the lines of that invariant. Okay, so let me ask you the second question. This one's, if you thought that was hard, this one's the harder one. When you're a programmer, how do you make sure that's true? How do you write the code to make sure that invariance is true? Okay, plots. You only have public accessors that only allow the data structure to be manipulated in the way that you want it to. Ah, yes, absolutely. So in other words, if I was to find a, um, a library, right, and I have inside that library is the linked list data structure, right? I only give accessor functions that take me from a legal state to another legal state. I completely agree. Uh, let me shift the next question a little bit. If you're the implementer of the library, okay, how do you make sure that your code doesn't accidentally transform you from a legal state to an illegal state? You can make the preconditions and the postconditions and make sure that each method doesn't break them. Okay. Preconditions. 
post conditions are related to your variance. Okay. Yeah, I, I think you're I think you're on the right track. Yep. Yeah, but but what I'm trying to get at here is that this requires um, uh, on every single operation that you sort of mentally animate every code path because if you have an if statement or something like that, you have to check them out. What if the x is greater than zero? And then what if it's the last thing in the list? And then what if it's the first thing in the list? What if I start with an empty list? You sort of have to sort of in your head mentally animate all the different possible states that the current data structure could be in. And like you said, when I do this transformation, like add an element or remove an element or whatever the transformation is, I make sure that I handle all the cases and the invariant is still gonna hold, okay? And for me, as, as, a, as a young kid growing up, uh, I thought that was really, really hard, okay? But that's the whole point. It's like everyone, when they first do the data structure, thinks that's really, really hard. And I want you guys to all say yes with me. Yes, that it, making sure the invariants hold is really, really hard because you can maintain it 99% of the time except for, ah, what if there's nothing in the list yet? Well, yes, actually, then my code runs through and makes a bad data structure, right? I think that comment that somebody else made that you just you have to you know, devise your public interface and hide all the details inside. I think that's the very fruitful for this type of thing because okay. your invariants can be completely hidden inside and not a lot of people manipulate and the pointer. Yep. All you do is just you define interface that cannot screw those things. And then you write the code inside the class, inside your type to make sure that all the invariants are preserved. Absolutely. Completely agree. Yep. Right. But, then, but in that case, the, it's the writer who still knows everything. Yes. Anybody outside of that writer note cannot prove or disprove whether or not they've actually implemented it. You're prefetching my question. That was my second question, which is let's say you're this guy's manager and he's just written a linked list implementation. You say, here are the invariants. Demonstrate to me that you maintain these invariants. Well, then not really that code tests. Yeah, okay, I mean, code test, test again, you can demonstrate the presence or not the absence of bugs. You could write a proof, which is something I had to do once when yeah. I had a data structure problem. Yeah. When I wrote the proof, then I found my mistake. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah. See, actually, that was a that was a uh, an active line of research for a long time, and they thought, you know, eventually by today we will be proving all of our programs correct, and that really hasn't uh, worked out so well. Uh, mostly because uh, the proofs sort of start to hit some combinatorial explosion, right? And you have 100 million lines of code, and your algorithms are n squared, and yeah, it doesn't work out well. In fact, I don't even know the algorithms are n squared. It could be worse. Um, but uh, the the point being that even today. You know, after computer science has been around for 60 years, right? Programs a long time. Uh, we have a really hard time uh, gaining confidence that our code does what, even in the small, 20 lines of code, gaining complete confidence that we've maintained an invariant. Okay. So now that you're all on the same page with me, yes, it's hard to maintain invariants. It's hard to gain complete confidence. You haven't forgotten an edge case or something like that. I'd like to take you to the large. <laughs> okay. And I would like to suggest that uh, asking developers to be vigilant and maintain invariants in the large across 100 million lines of code with all the imperfect communication paths inside of a company, right? Think about the Facebook guys. I mean, think about the growth that they had. It's, it's almost inevitable if you request that they please follow this coding pattern to maintain this invariant, somebody didn't get the message somewhere. Someone was coding at you know, 11 p.m., right? Somebody was you know, doing what? Uh, somebody modified somebody else's code to add a feature and forgot that there was an extra code path, right? When you get to that sort of scale, it becomes very difficult to imagine that this is always going to be effective. Okay, so uh, I'm going to distinguish uh, a particular kind of invariant. Okay, a constraint is a kind of invariant, right? It says do the following thing. Don't don't do the following thing. Most constraints we think about uh, are bad things, right? You know, like you only get 256k of RAM. Ha ha! You must run on an AS400, and you're like, what's an AS400? <laughs> you know, there's always some annoying constraint that isn't there to make the problem easier for you to solve. However, in the linked list, we impose the invariant on ourselves to make our lives easier, right? We're trying to make a data structure that behaves one way and not another way. When we say we have a pipe and filter system, we might impose our guide rail that says no loops in our pipe and filter system. It's just a scaled up version of the same kind of thing. Why do we do that? Because it helps our reasoning. It helps our reasoning. We can think through the problem if we know what the system doesn't do. If we say, for example, on the authentication, if we say, anytime anyone gets beyond here, we know they've already been an authenticated user, right? And so we can reason through what must be, what must be true, assuming that our condition holds, our, our guide rail holds. And I'm using the, the term guide rail distinctly from constraint because the, most people, when they think about constraints, are like, oh, I already know constraints. Yes. What I'm thinking about is guide rails, as in this is a roller coaster down here. 
we would like this to be a fun-filled ride rather than an actual death trap, right? We would like to say, please do a loop-to-loop, -loop, but don't kill me, right? And so the constraint is don't kill me, i.e. it's a guide rail. It says, I want you to go this direction, but not off the rails, right? Off in someplace else. So, so is it guide rail a positive statement then? Yeah, I'm trying to turn, I'm trying to, I'm trying to take it back. I'm trying to take back the idea of constraints. I'm going to rebrand them as guide rails and say, actually guys, we impose constraints on ourselves all the time in order to simplify our reasoning so that we can make sure we know where we're going. Yeah. And so I, I think we do this, like, again, we do that uh, just like we do hoisting today. We do guide rails today, but we, we call them constraints, but they're distinct from the kind of annoying constraints that people give us that make our job harder. These are constraints we impose upon ourselves so that we can reason through our design and make sure we go the right direction. Okay, that is in the book too, so that one's easy. Like enterprise architecture. Yeah. Okay, so uh, intentional stuff like invariance, constraints, or guide rails are all over our code at all sorts of different scales, and it's easy to break them during maintenance. Okay, we're all on the same page here? Okay. <coughs> so, uh, why would I possibly use invariance or constraints or guide rails? Um, you know, because your first instinct is, wait a second, if some of this stuff is easy to translate into code, why would I do the stuff that's hard to translate into code? And the, you know, that's a perfectly reasonable reaction to stuff. I just don't want to do any constraints in the code. I don't want to use any invariants in my code. Well, the hypothesis I have here is that the goal of design is to enable reasoning. I want to be able to reason through something, right? I obviously want a solution that works, but I design it in a certain way. I choose designs that are easier to reason about, and I reject designs that are harder to reason about. Given a choice between two designs, which both work, or both appear to work, if one's simpler and easier to understand, I'm going to prefer that one, okay? All those things being equal, right? And I'm going to look for ways of designing systems that allow me to reason through them and come to the conclusion that it indeed does what it's supposed to do, okay? Whether it's me that's deciding that or it's the stakeholders deciding what it's supposed to do, that's what I want. So let me give you a little thought experiment to, to test this hypothesis. Start with a comprehensible, analyzable design, the kind you would make today, right? <laughs> Imagine someone coming along with a code, or sorry, a design obfuscator that just sort of like switches stuff around and makes it confusing and adds you know, special cases and all the kinds of stuff that uh, the requirements guys always do to us. But imagine that it still comes out with the exact same output as it did before. And you keep doing that until it's just this tangled mess of logic that you can't decipher. Okay? And so therefore, I'm going to say, you don't like that design because you can't figure out if it's going to do the right thing. Even if someone assures you that it does the right thing, they say, no, no, I promise, it does the same thing as what you did before, you're still like, I don't have any confidence it did anything before because I can't reason through it, okay? So maybe this isn't the only goal of design, but certainly a very important one, right? That the world's a big, crazy, complicated, confusing place, right? Touring machines are almost impossible to figure out what they're going to do. Well, let me shrink it all down into this little constrained world where I can reason through what's actually going to happen. I think that's what we're doing. So the problem we've got is that emergent properties, quality attributes, any of this intentional design intent is hard to reason about. And so therefore what we do is we impose guide rails on our design so that we can reason through. Is my car going to be reliable? Is my server going to be secure? And so forth. And so they improve our reasonabilities, and it's particularly important in architecture where the scale is bigger, right? So it's important to have an invariance in a data structure. It's very important to have these sort of guide rails in an architecture because as the scale grows larger, your, your brain sort of gives up with all the special cases. Okay? So I think what comes next, yes, okay. Uh, what comes next is a little bit of a party trick. If you guys are ready for this, I'd like your complete and undivided attention for 15 seconds. And what I'm gonna ask you to do, uh, very reasonably, I might add, is to memorize the next slide. Um, and uh, one of these things so, Yep, okay. I'm gonna leave it on for 15 seconds, and then you're gonna tell me if you've been able to memorize it in 15 seconds, okay? You guys ready? Wait, wait till it's the top of the hour. All right. Go. Who has confidence they've memorized that slide? I have confidence I didn't memorize it. Okay. Did anyone notice any patterns to the, yes. when they were trying to memorize it? What was the pattern? Oh, monster rules, sequentials. Huge help, right? Yeah. For the number, number 12 of them, you already know the 12 months, and they're in order. Okay, great. So then you just had to memorize the numbers, right? Yes. So that's easy, right? No. No? Okay. Because there were four, one, four, one, seven, 12. Were they all 35 days apart? 
Okay, so I'm going to make this game a lot easier. I'm going to give you three seconds to memorize the next slide. You ready? Okay, three slides, three seconds. One, two, three. Okay, does anyone have any confidence in memorize that slide? Yes. It's not even fair. I could have given you one second to memorize that slide. However, however long it took you to read that sentence, that's how long it takes you to memorize it. Okay. Um, and, and, and see, I, I said this is a cheap parlor trick, but you get the point is that uh, in order to reason through something, if you have a general rule, it's like, ah, it just like cuts like a knife through all the, the complexity and chaos, and suddenly you're like, oh, well, that's perfectly straightforward. I, I actually now have confidence that I understand, and I haven't forgotten. In fact, I could ask you tomorrow, and you'd still have confidence you remember that second slide, right? Whereas I probably ask you at the end of the talk if you could still remember that first slide, even if you were able to memorize it, you'd probably be losing confidence with every, you know, second. And that sort of resembles code, right? Because sometimes you can dig down into the code, you can gain confidence actually it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, right? And then you leave it alone and you come back a week or a month later and you're like, now why was I sure that this was doing the right thing? And sometimes even, I've done this, you go in and you break something accidentally and then you're like, because, oh, I was an idiot, what was I doing? And then you realize, oh yeah, I did that because, and it wasn't obvious why you had the code doing something. Anyway, so. The point is, we're trying to reason through stuff. We impose guide rails to give us compl uh, to reduce complexity, to give us a way to reason through the program. Okay, so I don't think guide rails or invariants or any of that stuff. They're not optional. These are absolutely essential ways for us to deal with the complexity of the system. Okay, so now you're sold on the idea that we have to use guide rails to deal with the intentional design intent that we've got. Okay, what are my options? Okay, first one is uh, we have design guidance plus developers being vigilant. Always write thread safe handlers in, in your code, right? And look, let's not diss this. This is, this is the dominant way we do things today, right? Tomorrow we could have like also plus reference example. You know, oh, like yeah. Because yeah. like, that definitely is coming from the open access tool to like right. reference. You're absolutely right. Yep. Yep. Okay. I'm just trying to. Sometimes I try to distill it to the simplest version so I can compare and contrast. So what I like to compare that with is the second option, which is we hoist the guide rail. So that's the EJB example. Uh, the architecture ensures there's no handler interactions. Right. Now you got to ask yourself, why do I believe that's the case? Why do I trust EJB? But assuming I do trust EJB, it's done. Right. I don't have to do anything else. There's actually a third option, which I'm, I'm going to mention for completeness, but in most cases is not the case. Uh, does anyone know what static analysis is? Okay. Essentially, this is a program that looks at your looks at your program and tells you if it does the thing you think it does. Okay. In general, what you say with static analysis is, uh, here's the thing that I think is true. Can you run this program against my program and tell me if that's in fact what happens? Uh, when you're doing uh, in Eclipse or any modern IDE and you're doing it in Java. It'll occasionally tell you, no, 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 there's a path through this thing that doesn't return, or there's a path through this thing that returns something other than what you expect you're returning, right? Um, sometimes it'll even warn you uh, that this variable has not yet been initialized through some path through the code, right? You're using it, but you know, there's a path through the code where there's an if statement that it doesn't get initialized, okay? These are all examples of static analysis. They're special things you can do. Static analysis works today, great in the small. That's why we can build it into all of our IDs, okay? In Limited cases, we can do static analysis across large programs. Uh, the, the mantra today in static analysis is uh, little proofs about big programs, or little little outcomes about big programs. So, for example, if you're programming in C, uh, there's a bunch of tools that will help you with the, uh, if I allocated memory, did I deallocate the memory? And you think about all the different places, all the different paths through the code, it's trying to match all those up. Computers are very good about being meticulous about that kind of stuff. And the guys who wrote the static analysis have been very clever about how not to have that uh, be too complicated, okay? But they can do that. They can run through your code and, and with some confidence in some cases say, yes, indeed, you don't have any memory leaks. Pretty nice. Uh, but obviously, but, they're but, not okay. wasted. Yeah. So, so I'm just saying, this is a third example. There are cases where static analysis can uh, say, indeed, I've investigated every path through your program and it does work. They still have problems with composability. So if I have module A, property holds. Module B, property holds. Module A plus B, I generally have to run the analysis again to make sure that there's not an interaction between the two that doesn't break the, uh, the stuff. So harder, and it, it, gets, it, it runs longer the bigger your program is. Um, 
in general, you have to be an expert in writing static analysis in order to um, to get something that isn't that, that doesn't come out of the box. Uh, various vendors have tried to make this easier and easier for end users to and end users being software developers to write their own analyses. But in general, it's really tricky to do these things, and you can't assume that you got one of these things for you're just you're like I just thought up of a new invariant. <laughs> It's not going to exist out of the box for static analysis. So I'm not putting that one seriously on the list. I'm really saying most people choose to use it. So plenty of people also use it in um, uh, to look for problems. So you, they usually yeah. look for presence of antibodies, right? Yeah. So like code analysis that would flag you know, yes. bad practice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the find bugs and PMD stuff. I mean, they're absolutely great tools. Yeah, very helpful. And if you don't know what find bugs and PMD are, you should Google them when you get home and try them out. They're very useful. Okay, so uh, this has all been a big build up to get to this point uh, to say, uh, let's talk about architecture hoisting and what is this thing, how do I do it, okay? So my algorithm for doing this is figure out what the for all is in the global property. First of all, you probably don't have it very clear in your head exactly what this invariant is, especially when we deal with architecture, right? But you need to say, for example, okay, if I'm dealing with this Facebook problem with don't, uh, don't forget to put the data back in the cache. If you put it in the database, put it in the cache. So right, you so, somehow figure out and say, for all um, writes into the database, um, if I wrote to the database, then I also uh, have a write into the, uh, the memcache stuff, okay? So you wanna be sort of careful about that. Once you've identified the for all, that means that you can then choose an architectural mechanism to make sure that that property is always gonna hold. Okay, and we'll come to the mechanisms slide in a couple things here, but this sort of makes sense, right? One, you have to identify what the thing is you want to be done. That is, identify the feature that you want, and then you build an architecture or mechanism that gives you that feature. Sometimes you can be very, very clever, and you can actually just constrain the architecture in such a way that that bad thing can never happen, right? So for example, um, uh, oh, this is a trivial example. Uh, in most APIs, you cannot, uh, for a hash table, you can't add a key without a value, right? And that's just a function of the, of the API, right? And so you can say the invariant is that every key has a value, but you could say also, it's not mechanically possible to break that because of the API, maybe, right? Sometimes you can do similar things in the architecture, right? If you wanna say, connect this with this, you can never end up with a situation where there's a dangling such and such because you know there's only one architecture operation which connects the two things, okay? So we'll talk about the mechanisms in a minute. Uh, the reason that this is successful is we've transformed a problem from programming the large to programming the small. How so? Well, before I had this invariant or constraint or uh, guide rail that applied to my entire program and I wanted it to be true. That's a programming the large problem, that's a pain, right? We've already convinced ourselves that that's difficult. A programming in the small problem is like with the data structure, with the linked list, I'm trying to maintain an invariant inside the linked list. So your question should be, when I make this an architectural mechanism, why do I trust that architectural mechanism works? Well, I can trust it to the extent that I can trust a linked list implementation, right? I, I can trust it within the implementation, for example, in EJV of doing, um, of making sure my concurrency works, I probably only have to look at a couple hundred lines of code to figure out that that's true. I don't have to look at every single possible event handler in the system and make sure all of them are, are, are thread safe. Instead, I've made it a small problem for me to analyze, and that's something that humans are pretty good at. And actually, machines are much better at too, but, but definitely humans are. So we've moved it from a programming a large problem to a programming a small problem, which is, in general is a win, right? We've made it easier for us to reason our way through the problem. Okay, to gain confidence, it works. Okay, so let's recap where we are. And for those of you who are playing along with the home game, you may have seen this slide before. <laughs> we had this slide at the very beginning. And it didn't make a whole lot of sense. So now we're gonna try it, now that we've talked about it. Design is about enabling our reasoning and analysis. There are different kinds of design ideas, the extensional and the intentional. The extensional is straightforward mapping to code, just over a different scale. Architecture stuff, big components. Down here we've got classes, but that's not really complicated. And unfortunately, intentional stuff doesn't map to the code. That causes all the trouble, and that's usually all the quality attributes that we're worried about, the uh, scalability, the performance, you know, any of the stuff. You, you can't look at a chunk of the code and say, where is that stuff? So we're always trying to maintain these across uh, lots of different parts of the system. In the small, vigilance 
works great for maintaining invariance. When I say works great, I still have some concerns, but it's, it's sort of, we can consider that in the solved problem category of, I can write, I can teach undergraduates to maintain invariance, right? Um, and uh, even if it's tricky, it's doable. In the large, however, you, we can try to maintain these guide rails, these uh, invariants up here, but it's hard and it's error prone. Uh, if you have a large organization, you just gotta assume that you're gonna find violations. Violations meaning bugs, okay? And the complexity grows with scale. So the bigger your organization, the bigger the amount of code, the more likely you're gonna have trouble. So we may end up choosing architecture hoisting instead. Okay, so hopefully this slide makes a whole lot more sense than it did 20 minutes ago or whatever when we started. Okay, any questions about where we are so far? Yes, but um, uh, when we talk about architecture here in this context, I keep, like the way I'm interpreting what you're saying is that it kind of implies that there needs to be some kind of a framework built out to support this architecture because um, otherwise we're right back to just writing a kind of an architecture guidelines document and saying, hey, developers, just follow this, those guidelines and you'll be fine, right? Um, otherwise, Yes. The implied thing going behind all this talk is really that there's something that needs to be built out as part of this uh -huh. technique. So you're going to have to build out an yeah. architectural framework and then on top of it, that's where we'll put, because that's for example, HAP. Mm -hmm. um, it has the whole container, it's container. It has the whole yes. standard um, that is implemented, right? And that's why you're really trusted, because in the standard it says, here's what it's supposed to do, yes. and this container says, I'm adhering to that standard, so right. you trust it, right? Um, but if it was just the standard, yes. right. your developers have to write for the presence. Yeah, so, yeah, this is what I'm, what I'm yeah, trying to get here. What, okay. And again, a lot of the stuff didn't make sense because we were sort of wandering through it. Okay, now that you've got it all, you've, you've digested it, you've come to this point. Yes, usually you're going to end up with some runtime presence of the thing. I think we can imagine a few specific cases where we can be clever and do it in other ways. But for the most part, you know, the message bus has to exist or the container has to exist. Not everything about your architecture has to be in that runtime stuff. There's still maybe other stuff, which is guidelines. But the part you hoist almost always has a runtime presence. That's, that's my impression. And I'd like to have a, a big uh, catalog of examples of things we count as hoisting. And then we could actually look across this. But all the examples that I know of, mm -hmm. they have runtime presence. Okay. But there should be a, a financial benefit to it because you're going from n instance implementations to one. Yes. Yeah, well, but yeah, it's not in implementations necessarily. It's in things that respect, for example, follow this yeah. protocol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's not exactly the same. Like I'm not implementing linked list twenty times. I'm just respecting it or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. still small. Yes. Perfect. Here we are. Okay. So everything from now on should be architecture that's wasted, right? Well, maybe not. Okay, so here, here we are. Uh, let's get to an actual definition. This is a better definition, I think, than what we had in the book. Architecture hoisting is a design technique where the architecture ensures an intentional design constraint, i.e. a guide rail, thereby achieving a global property. So one concern you may have is, well, I already provide a whole bunch of shared services with my architecture, or I already provide some structure with my architecture. Is that architecture hoisting? I would say, no, not unless those things are actually ensuring that a constraint holds, right? That's the whole point. And this is the dis distinction between the definition I have here and the definitions in the book. I think this is clearer, right? That you, when you're architecturally hoisting, you're identifying a guide rail or some sort of, you know, for all kind of statement. You're gonna say, all right, that's mine, ta-da! And you're gonna give it to the architecture and the architecture is gonna implement some code usually and make sure that that thing is gonna work out that way, okay? So it's closely tied, tied to the intentional design intent. And it's just one option to achieve it, the other being developer vigilance. I mean, we also talked about um, static analysis in some cases. Okay? Do you guys agree this is an improved definition? It gets us there? Okay, it gets it on. Okay. So here are some mechanisms we talked about for implementing this thing. Uh, a layer or a virtual machine. Now, a virtual machine is pretty obvious, right? Um, if, if I want to say, I want to run Macintosh programs on my PC, I run one of these virtual machine things, right? And it pretends like it's a plain vanilla machine and then therefore I can run the uh, Macintosh 
uh, operating system on top of this thing, right? So a virtual machine allows you to uh, insist that uh, it works a certain way. A layer might do the same thing. The layer is sort of a weaker version, perhaps, of a virtual machine, or in some interpretations of the layer pattern, that means it strictly is a virtual machine. Uh, another interesting one here is the language or the compiler or the interpreter or the runtime. If you think about uh, Java compared to C, one of the things that it hoists is memory management, right? You don't have to do memory management in Java, or at least you have to do very little of it, okay, compared to C. So that's a case where the JVM or the language spec is really hoisting uh, that particular property about the language. It's a very low level property. We don't usually think about it as architectural, but that's a good kind of thing, yeah. Oh, sorry, that's true. Uh, raise your hand. Um, another example, I don't, I don't have an example of this, but I'm pretty sure that we can make a domain specific language do the same thing. <coughs> that is, uh, if we had, let's say we're working in the financial domain and I wrote a DSL that talks about how derivatives work or how some financial instrument works, right? And I can only operate on them in certain ways and therefore that maintains an invariant because I structured my language for that to be the case. Well, effectively, I have just hoisted that into the architecture, right? And I may not even have any runtime presence other than the, other than the interpreter for the language, okay? Um, a framework is a great example, right? Especially with frameworks that have inversion of control. And, and I, you might argue that that's all frameworks, okay? But what I mean by that is, uh, if you start your program and the framework occasionally like calls back into your code and says, aha, it's time for you to paint the screen now, like if it's an application, right? Uh, or it's time for you to do that other thing, uh, then that's a great example where the uh, architecture embodied in the framework can have a lot of control. Uh, an application server like EJB and, uh, and uh, servlets, both of those things are frameworks, right, that call back into your code. They run the handling routine that does all the server stuff, and occasionally they say, oh, well, there's been a web request, you might want to handle it, here you go, okay? So it calls back into your code. Uh, API we talked about before, like add key value in the hash table. Uh, your type system may actually allow you to express certain things and not other ones, or, or you can't put integers inside of strings or vice versa, right? You can't mix up those types. Um, or a library, okay? These are all kinds of things you can imagine uh, using. And I would like to flesh this out so that we had good examples for each one of these, but we're, we're not quite there yet. What about type system again? Uh, well, one of the things a type system does is uh, it, it will insist that certain things must be true. Um, so in other words, you can't write a program in Java where you take an integer and stick it into a string, or you take a sailboat and you put it in the slot for a tank. Uh, it just, the, the, the type system won't let you do that. Right. So it, it's strongly and statically typed. Yeah, it won't let you do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Although usually each of the language has ways to defeat it, right? Uh, but, but I was thinking of more, if, if you encapsulate your architectural concern into a type, for instance, like in your case, okay, there's, there's, there's going to be a single database writer yes. which will ensure that the stuff is also put in the map yes. for them. Right. So then it's a single kind of concern, single responsibility mm -hmm. for and, and I would still add aspect oriented program. So if you take out you know certain implementation outside of the code completely, yep. it becomes just aspect that you express and then you let some something else, some other code framework to handle it. Right. Um, or getting back to the same example, you can imagine a framework for it that says that uh, you know I've got data elements that I work with that come from a framework class, or a subclass off of a framework class, and the framework class, if, as long as you say retrieve and persist, it does the right thing and it writes to the, it gets it out of cache if necessary in the database. And maybe they do that. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, sorry, they mean Facebook. Uh, maybe they've done that by now. But I just remember reading this report that they had to be diligent about that at one point. Okay, so uh, here's another example, uh, the Apache Portable Runtime. Uh, they had a situation where they wanted to run, uh, they wanted to write one web server and have it work uh, on lots of different platforms, and they built this library, or a layer, a virtual machine, depending on what you want to call it, uh, the APR, the Apache Portable Runtime, and whenever Apache wants to do anything like with a socket or any other OS specific stuff, it actually calls down into the OS bindings, right, the APR, and ta-da, run off to the races, and you essentially plug in different versions of the, this on each platform, and you keep the same Apache running on it, okay? Uh, you can make an argument, this is an example of hoisting, because they have this property. What, what do you think the property might be they're trying to maintain? Yeah, uh, whichever platform we're running on, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be safe, or something like that, okay? I'm gonna contrast that with Xbox Media Center, 
Uh, does anyone know what Xbox Media Center is? It's a, it's a media software that's meant to run on your computer uh, that sits underneath your TV, and you, with your remote control, you can play movies or play your music and stuff like that. And they have a plug-in system. The plug-in system allows you, for example, if Xbox Media Center already plays uh, movies on your hard drive and plays music on your hard drive, maybe you want to connect to the internet and play it off of uh, ESPN.com, okay? And so this plugin would allow you to do that. You can write plugins in Python. They gave you guidelines on how to make sure that those Python plugins were cross-platform. An example of something you can't do and still be cross-platform is write the C colon slash temp, right? Very standard thing to do. I've got, I'm buffering a stream from CNN, from CNN or ESPN. I'm gonna write it to disk. Okay, how do I do that? Okay, well, APR, Apache Portable Runtime, says if you need to get to the disk, here's your cross-platform way of doing it. Xbox Media Center did not provide a cross-platform way of doing that, but they provided guidance, which leads us to some questions. Is this hoisted? From the way I've described it, I would probably say no. What can it guarantee? What can it guarantee? The mechanism they gave us, which is uh, uh, an ability to write plugins and guidance on what not to do. Follow the guidelines you get to guarantee. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Then the, then the real question is, like when I look at EJB or Apache Portable Runtime, those seem to be different than what's going on with Xbox Media Center, but I can still imagine there being bugs in the Apache Portable Runtime that might not give me cross-platform stuff. Or there could be bugs in the EJB concurrency implementation that might not get what I wanted. So what does it mean for it really to be a guarantee? So let's really try to think about this as a gradient, okay? So it isn't just binary, guaranteed or not guaranteed. And here's why, is because we're dealing with general purpose programming languages. There's almost always a way that there's an escape hatch that a developer writing, oh, even an EJB, right? They give you guidelines that says, don't start your own threads inside your EJBs, right? And I think maybe even today they catch that. Okay, but certainly at one point I know they did not. Uh, they also ask you, don't write to local files because those won't be around if you move you from server to server, okay? So there's always gonna be opportunities to break the constraints and violate this global property. So there's no such thing, I would think as perfect hoisting. Uh, but maybe here's a better test. Let's call it a guarantee if a well-intentioned developer is going to allow this thing to happen, right? Now, we're not talking about somebody who's trying to <laughs> break into your system, right? You know, that's that's a different category of situation. Um, and so in this categorization, I would say the EJB and Apache Portable Runtime uh, probably would be close to being a guarantee of this property, right? The, 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 the trying to hoist. The next is an affordance. Uh, for example, if you provide a platform-independent library that allows you to get to something, well, actually, I, I, I'm sorry, I put uh, Apache up here, but Apache is maybe down here, and it's an affordance. There's nothing in the Apache code that stops them from writing to the disk, but I gave you a library that says, here's how you read and write from the disk, and it's cross-platform, so why don't you just use that? Okay, so that's better, but not a guarantee. Okay? Up here, it's difficult to write an EJB that breaks the property, right? Here, it's really easy to follow the guideline, okay? And then down here in the best guidelines and best practices, it's like, well, it's actually kind of hard to follow that guideline. It's hard to, to write thread-safe code. It's hard to remember every single path through my code to always write to the to the memcache and stuff, right? So, sorry, a question? Yeah, I was gonna say, so with the discussion here, we're going to say that even the guarantees part requires a little bit of uh, developer vigilance, uh, but it, it's a dramatic reduction compared to what you had to do before. Okay, so think about architecture hoisting as a technique that you can employ. It's not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve all your problems, but it's going to dramatically reduce the amount of vigilance you're going to require of programmers in order to keep this to get this emergent property. Okay, there are some of these things. Some of the mechanisms have stronger guarantees than others. Okay. Uh, frameworks with inversion of control, like I said, like the EJB container, right? It calls back into the developer code every once in a while. It really runs the show, and every once in a while allows the developer to do something else. And I'm sorry, when I say the developer to do something else, I mean I could be the developer. I, I just mean the, the 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 power between the container and the handler code is asymmetric, right? The architecture of the system is dictated by the container, right? And every once in a while it calls back into. Um, languages have a pretty strong version, so like Java with the garbage collection, that's pretty strong. And DSLs and virtual machines, again, very pretty, pretty strong implementations of uh, poisoning. You have a question? No? Okay. 
So uh, let's just talk through the design guidance just so we fully understand this and see what could be wrong with it. The first thing is, in order to give guidance, you have to recognize what the requirement is. And I'm gonna say a lot of times, people haven't thought through exactly how the, what the guidance is to get them to, uh, what, what you need to say to developers to say, this is the way you maintain this invariant. You know that you don't want slow systems, you know you don't want vulnerable systems, you don't, you don't want uh, unreliable systems, but it's difficult to identify exactly what the thing is that you want them to do, okay, to get there. So that's the first thing, you recognize the requirement. The second is, do you know at least one way to achieve it? Okay, because you need to say, I'd like you to do the following thing. You have to figure out at least one way you could please tell them to do the following thing to get to it. If you, this is a social thing, if you provide design guidance, how do you communicate it? Okay, uh, there's plenty of cases uh, documented where in the Java standard library, there's a long Java doc page that describes correct API usage of something, and eventually they said, okay, forget it. We just need to change the API because no one's using it correctly, no matter how well we document. Okay, and that's documentation that you can generally get to from within your IDE. Now imagine in your company if you send out a memo or you have a, a company-wide conference call or a video conference and you try to say, hey guys, this is what we're trying to achieve in order to get compliance for the regulations, we need you to do the following things. How exactly do you communicate what they're supposed to be doing and how do you get confidence that everyone really has gotten the message? Okay, this is just purely from a human-to-human -human communication. How do you know they've really done it? How they've, how they've gotten the message? So once you've provided the guidance, how do you ensure that it's actually being followed? I mean, some places have code reviews, some places don't, right? Um, some things are easy to check in code reviews, like the, uh, the security example, like at this junction, you should make sure you have the security token or you've looked up the, the fact that this person's authenticated. Other places, not so easy. So does the vigilance actually ensure success? Even with good faith by developers, there's complicated code paths that they need to reason about uh, is, is there possibly a path through the code that actually violates your invariant? Uh, humans are really bad at this kind of stuff, right? Um, so the, this is the bring, coming back to the poem to own thing. Uh, the Google guys, let's assume the, they've got sharp guys working on this web browser. It's up till now been pretty darn secure, right? They haven't had uh, big vulnerabilities. But even then, they were trying to maintain this invariant uh, with the use after free and it wasn't successful, okay? So I would just say, I think we're all on the same page now, we should have some amount of skepticism about whether uh, just telling people to maintain this invariant is really going to work, okay? From, from the standpoint of did I communicate it correctly? Did I, did I tell them correctly? Did they understand it? Uh, were they able to analyze the program to make sure that they were able to keep that invariant, okay? So it's pretty tricky. So uh, now, uh, you have this problem. Uh, you've been through this talk. You now have been trained up with a lot of language. We can talk about intentional design constraints. You're like, you're, I can see you guys, and your brain's like turning through this stuff. It's been pretty cool to watch. Just imagine what's going on when we have this discussion. That you, you, you reply to this guy's web posting. This guy says, the framework stinks. And you reply to the following. Our group is using that framework so we can satisfy requirements to uphold a global property. All web inputs must be sanitized. The framework provides a single hoist implementation for request processing and ensures the intentional design constraint, the guide rail, is always maintained. The alternative is that developers must be uh, constantly vigilant in upholding that property and must be able to reason through every possible code path, identifying and eliminating paths where the design constraint can be broken. Okay? Hopefully, you guys are looking at that and saying, that's as straightforward as I could write it. I mean, that's a completely clear reply to the developer. What are the chances that the developer is actually going to get that? Right? And what is it that is, what are the chances that you guys had read this at the beginning of this lecture that this would fully make sense? Okay? Eh, I mean, more likely than random developer, okay? Because we've already been thinking about architecture, you could sort of say, eh, intentional design constraint, and probably we know what that means, okay? And it's all spelled out. But a lot of people would just turn their brain off and say, oh, yeah, I don't know, he talked some gook. I don't know what he's talking about. Blah. Some stuff came out. So, However, compare that with the grumbling Chrome developer. The Chrome developer is grumpy because he was trying to follow the, the constraint and he was failing. And he's looking at this saying, maybe there's a way we could do something. Maybe automatic memory management inside of Chrome would be a good idea. Maybe he'd say it stinks, okay? But he'd say, let's at least look into that possibility of having an automatic mechanism, because then I don't have to be visual anymore. Okay. So, 
Let me suggest something on the other hand. This grumbling developer may be right. The framework might stink, it might be a bad design. Just because we're well-intentioned in hoisting and thinking about doing the right thing, we can still make mistakes, right? We can do this wrong. You can look at EJB as an interesting evolution between the three different versions. I, I, you're, you're nodding your head, I think. Anyone who's worked with EJB uh, sort of seen there's a big change. Uh, EJB 1, 2, and 3, I'm going to argue that the, concern, the concurrency restrictions and therefore you know, the emergent property of safe concurrency have been win, right? They haven't significantly changed that. However, they dramatically changed the syntax when they went from version 2 to 3, and the persistence model, remember the old persistence model, you'd have entity beans and that you say, persist it for me, I don't care how you do it, right? That's another example of, I don't have to worry about uh, persistence, right? It's a, a, a global property. They got rid of that, right? So now the developer has much more fine-grained control, they use hibernate, um, and essentially it's a, it's a different model. So just because we have a design technique that's actually well-intentioned in trying to do the right thing, um, it is a straitjacket for developers. There may be a bunch of bureaucracy we're imposing upon them, and it may not be the right thing. Okay? There's trade-offs associated with using hoisting. Uh, what we are doing is we're substituting the ability for developers to make independent decisions in each case and replacing it with a single standardized mechanism. Okay? With all the benefits and trade-offs that come with that, right? So, for example, when I build a garbage collection into a language, it's great for some things and it's terrible for other things, right? I do not want to write a device driver in Java because it's got automatic garbage collection, right? And almost the definition of what I do with the device driver is I'm explicitly managing chunks of memory and doing it as efficiently as I can to get the best I.O. from this device, okay? And I also don't want it occasionally waking up and then doing garbage collection and, you know, causing delays. So, by using a standard mechanism, we disallow local choices and we can't resolve or optimize the trade-off locally. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we get all the advantages we get with, uh, with hoisting, right? So just want to make you guys aware, you know, there's no free lunch here. This is a, a technique that comes with, with trade-offs. So this gets at the point I was making before, but you look at that grumbling developer, and you wrote this nice email that explains exactly what your thinking was, and yet there's a disconnect between what you wrote and what the developer understood. And I'm going to say the problem here is that uh, we in this room, uh, you guys have been working on software architecture, you've been reading books on software architecture, your model of how software systems work is richer than when you were writing, when you were in your data structures class, right? And all you're thinking about was 20 lines of code. I'm not suggesting that every developer is at that same place, but I am suggesting that uh, we as a field of software engineering, we need to get a richer model of how this whole thing works. We need to think about uh, all the different concepts, we need to have everybody talk about intentional and extensional stuff, we need everyone to understand what frameworks are, components, guide rails, like there's a lot of stuff to be learned here and I think that only a sliver of the total software population understands this stuff. So this is what one of these courses that I ride, it's like we need to keep working on this bigger idea of a conceptual model of how software works. Um, Alan Kay, you know the guy who did uh, small talk, uh, he makes the point very strongly that Today's engineers, civil engineers, are not any smarter than the Roman civil engineers from a couple thousand years ago, okay? What we can do today, what those guys can do today, is dramatically better than what the Roman engineers can do. And primarily that's because each generation we've got better and better at compressing that knowledge so that when we, by the time somebody graduates at 22 years old with a civil engineering degree, they have the, the, an amazing amount of knowledge in their head, okay? That's far, far greater than the, the best Roman uh, engineer was 2,000 years ago. Okay, we're only 60 years old as, as computer science, but we still got to keep doing the same thing. You know, like, and we do it slowly but surely. But I say this mostly as a um, uh, as a way of uh, short circuiting an argument that I often hear. But but I fully understand. They'll they'll say, but I fully understand how the Apache portable runtime works. I don't need to understand architecture wasting. I'm like, yes, but you're understanding it through the details, and I have to wait until you're 40 years old before you fully understand it. And you're battle scarred and all that stuff. I want to make it so that we can just teach it in a book, so somebody could look up architecture hoisting, they see the technique, they see the pros, they see the cons, they see where it's applicable and where it's not. We've got to make sure that the next generation of developers understands everything that we understood. It took us 20 years to get to. I want them to get to in like a semester class, okay? And that's a pretty high standard, but we're going to try. So we win by making our conceptual models of how we understand software, make them richer and better, 
we make those connections and we figure out how to teach them. Because just understanding them is one thing and figuring out how to effectively get them in people's brains is another. Think about physics. How long have we understood Newtonian physics? A long time. Okay. The, the people still have workshops and they go to conferences about how to teach physics better, right? There, there's always this pedagogy argument about how do you get that into people's brains effectively. Right now, I would say we're only at the very beginnings of this for software engineering, right? Um, everyone agrees that when, so, uh, when you graduate from college uh, and you've taken your software engineering practicum course or whatever, it's like a pale comparison about what you get in your first year when you actually go on to the job. I think everyone is frustrated by this, but no one has cracked the nut. Nobody knows how to teach that yet. But what I'm trying to say is teaching them is a whole different ballgame. Okay. Uh, uh, from, uh, it yeah. seems like in the case of EJB, they tried to hoist too much mm -hmm. and they couldn't make it perform. Yeah. Yeah. Which would be interesting to still recognize in that situation too, because there seems to be this pattern in software like we do. Whatever it is, we waste too much, mm -hmm. and then there's a kind of an anti-reaction yeah. against it. Says, "Here's the lightweight version that actually works." That's your class at every tower of architecture, right? Yeah. You bring bring way too much to the table, you overkill. I, mean, yeah. I would even argue yeah. it, it probably it's not too much that is to blame. I think uh, probably what actually is happening, we all know that quality attributes compete. Once you try to maximize one, you would uh, detriment mm -hmm. some others. That's right. a good point. And so, yeah. you know, in any given architecture, you really want to prioritize the quality attribute and say which ones you want to maximize. And in the, in the case of trade war, trade off which one wins. If you're creating this hoisting <coughs> particular frameworks, you kind of make this decision a priori, mm -hmm. right? It may not be the right decision for a given party. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, security always impedes, you know, uh, performance or usability, right? Um, just like an example you gave with uh, you know, memory allocation, uh, alternative memory management, it hoist one thing, but it made the performance or, you know, slower, right? So, yeah, um, I would also recommend everybody take a look at uh, uh, Dick Gabriel's paper, Richard Gabriel's paper on worse is better. Have you guys seen this? No. Uh, essentially, he's arguing from, um, he's from the Lisp tradition. He said, like, Lisp had a bunch of stuff figured out, and they, they spent a long time, and they got everything just right. But it, it meant that it was complicated to get anything done. Uh, then C comes along. This is in the 70s, right? And C was like, nah, we don't do it right. You know, if you want to copy this chunk of memory onto this chunk of memory and they overlap, we'll let you do it. We just do it wrong. So we tell you, don't do it, right? <laughs> so uh, Lisp would handle all those funny cases. It would do all the stuff. And so his reflection on all that is that sometimes worse is better. He said the same, I don't remember <coughs> his example, or this is my example at this point, but uh, Corvo, right? Corvo was this distributed you know, networking standard or like how to make all these systems interoperate. And at some point, so it fell down underneath its own weight, and there was like 13 different uh, uh, areas of stuff, like security and distribution, and I don't know. Uh, there's all these different ones, and you're supposed to be able to understand how them all, and you as a developer are supposed to orchestrate them, and it had solved all the problems for you, except for the problem of having how long it would take you to understand how to solve the problem inside their uh, style of doing stuff. And so then, uh, Java comes along, and they're like, nope, remote method invocation, ta-da, trivially easy, but it only works Java to Java on certain machines with the same architecture or something like this. And so then they said, oh, well, what we'll do is we'll bolt on uh, the Corba stuff, right? And so then we've got the cross-platform Corba because it figures out the Endian nature of the bits. or what I, there was, I don't remember it was exactly that, but there was some reason they switched over using the Corba as the, the RMI connector. And then that, that messed up inside the Java language. Do you guys remember this whole evolution? Because used to be you just say, this is a remote method call, ta-da. And then now it would be you get something back and you'd have to cast it to the thing that you expected to get. And it would throw a runtime exception if, in fact, you asked for an integer and he sent you back a string or sent you back something of the wrong data type. Because that was possible under Corvo, but it wasn't possible under the old RMI thing. You see where I'm going about the worse is better. That, you know, like in some ways, the, the broken version, the original RMI, was just easy to use, right? But with the funny restriction that it was you know, same platform or something like that. And then as they made it broad and interoperable, you started inheriting all this baggage that made it hard to use. And now you've got uh, J2 or JEE, which is this uh, large uh, set of stuff that at any given point, you know there's probably something in there to solve it for you, but you have to spend three days learning how the J plus three, le three <laughs> letters uh, talks about how to solve that problem. Yeah. I would argue that it's not worse that it's better. It is just different circumstances, like a dialectic. Right, in any given problem, you have certain quality attributes that are 
most important than the other. So mm -hmm. in those situations, simplicity was the prevailing quality to do. In the other, it may be type C if you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not thinking this great. I would, however, say that you guys will probably all enjoy reading the worse is better paper. I think it's easy to, to find on the web. So uh, check that one out. Okay. Last thing, uh, we're just about done here. Uh, sort of uh, getting at the trade offs, actually. Uh, we're going to reflect on the whole uh, state of software engineering. Uh, most of us have never built anything at the fringe of engineering. I certainly haven't. Uh, I've interacted with people that have to do that kind of stuff. Uh, at the, at the, the far reaches of, I don't know if it's possible to do the following thing. Uh, in the 70s, these guys built the Sabre airline reservation system. They built the Visa credit card processing system. Uh, these things are now precedented, okay? Uh, and with today's computers, it's not so hard to imagine. But put yourself back into the 1970s and think about making a globally distributed network of credit card things that will accurately and safely uh, you know, allow you to charge. I mean, like, boy, I would be really scared to make sure I didn't get that one wrong in the bankrupt company. Iridium, they sort of pushed a little bit too far. They didn't quite get the business model very many, maybe. But, you know, there's examples of uh, things that don't always work out at the extremes. In this situation, I think a lot of us are surprised because we're so used to being good at our jobs. If someone asks us to build an X, we go out and we build an X and we're successful. But every once in a while, it just shocks me that we do not know how to build a secure operating system. And anyone who works in banking or has a computer and does online banking, you know that there are viruses out there, so viruses, whatever. They get on your computer and all they do is log your keystrokes and if you ever log into your bank, some bad guy back at control center is going to do the same thing. And uh, it makes you really scared that it's not the case that, oh, well, it's just Bob doesn't know how to make a secure operating system. I won't use Bob's software. Nobody knows how to make one. Nobody knows how to make a secure web browser. We just don't know how to build these things. So given this context, the state of the art of software design techniques is not so great. Okay, We'd like it to be a lot better. Um, we would like to be able to say, this is what I want, this is how I proceed to get to that thing. In some ways, it would make our lives boring, but for the most part, in other engineering disciplines, they can build what they want to build, okay? If you want to build a bridge from A to B, in these conditions, it may be easy, it may be hard, but you sort of know, and you can train people on how to do that stuff. We're pretty far from that. Even if you want to say, there are bridges that are too big to be built today, we have software that's too big to be built today, okay, fine, that's fine. But I'm saying even in medium size, we, we have a lot of medium sized bridges that fall down today that perhaps could be made better because they have better techniques. The next thing I want to sort of have you guys reflect on is static analysis and statically typed languages. I don't know who in this room is a fan of statically typed uh, languages versus dynamically typed languages. Certainly I like the syntax. I'm, a, I'm an old small talker, okay? So I like the syntax of uh, dynamically typed languages. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, statically typed languages are when I compile the code, it, it tells me that I won't have any type errors. Dynamically typed languages, it's not until I run the code do I find out if I've got any type problems. But in neither one can I stick strings and integers accidentally, right? I can't accidentally do that stuff. Not like C, where literally you could take a, a string of bits and say, no, 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 that's a string. That's, a, that's an integer. That's a whatever, right? That's, that's not a safe typing language, okay? Static analysis is a potentially very powerful technique and it works better on statically typed languages. The guys who add annotations to Java, they, they say, please, we want to be able to add these things, they want to do it so they can attach static analysis to it. And so, for example, if you put an annotation on something that says, does not return null, it'll run a static analysis and actually can tell you if it actually does return null. Now, in worst possible cases, it runs a dynamic analysis. That is, it runs and watches the program, if it returns null, it throws an exception or something like that. But this path, helps us get to the intentional constraints that we're trying to get to, right? And the more we can work on this, I guess really what I'm trying to get at to you guys is I'd like to change the perception. There's often a negative perception about statically typed languages like Java or Scala or something like that. And people like Ruby or Python. I like Ruby and Python too. But just realize that they make it much harder to do static analysis and that may be one of the ways that we can you know, get our programs higher quality, okay? And then finally, in this context of like, we don't know how to build certain things, architecture hoisting is a technique that we might be able to use that is a sort of a stepping stone, right? It's not, it doesn't revolutionize the state of software or engineering, nor does it automatically give us, you know, a solution for every um, intentional design constraint I've got in the program. It's a stepping stone. 
uh, that gets closer. Okay. So here's a summary, last slide. Architecture hoisting is a design technique where the architecture ensures an intentional design constraint, like a guide rail, thereby achieving a global property. It's suitable for intentional design intent, not extensional. So if you have a car and you want a turn signal, you don't use architecture hoisting, right? If you have a car and you want it safe, well, maybe there are certain safety things you could hoist, right? Maybe certain reliability things you could hoist. The intentional constraints are hard to ensure in code. You really have two options, developer vigilance, which scales very poorly with, with uh, the size. And uh, the second option is architecture hoisting, right? There are some mechanisms we talked about using frameworks, languages, DSLs, APIs, layers, virtual machines. These are ways, mechanisms to implement the hoisting. There's some good, bad, and other stuff about them. Um, the good thing about hoisting is it enforces an intentional design constraint. The bad part is that you have a trade-off because we standardize the solution means we don't allow ourselves local optimizations. And somewhere in the middle, neither bad or good, is just the sociology of the whole thing. We're fallible, we can make a bad, general implementation. We make one that's too bureaucratic. We can make one that's awkward. We can actually make one with bugs, too. We need to like, seriously consider that case. But yeah, so good, bad, and good. So your question's got to be, at the end of all this, do we really learn anything about uh, anything? And I'd say, yeah. What we've done is we've identified now an engineering technique that's teachable, okay, better teachable than was in the book. The book has like half a page on this stuff, right? And it says, now we can, we can show people and say, you, you know you're going to have this problem of intentional stuff you want to express, you want a bunch of programs to work with. You have two choices. Hey, that's good. I've enumerated the possibilities. Well, three if you count static analysis. Here are the choices you have going forward. Here's what it's good for. Here's what it's bad for. Here's when it's good. Here's when it's bad. And here's what it doesn't work for. It doesn't work for turn signals, right? It doesn't work for uh, stuff that you would say, this is a feature of my code as opposed to a property of my code. So I say, yeah, I think this is a pretty good, useful thing that if uh, all goes well in 10 years, it's sort of like, you know, this is sort of something that you talk about in your, you know, fourth year computer science class on software design. You know, that this is just one of the standard mechanisms. Okay, so that's it. That's what I've got on um, architecture hoisting.